Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Upadesha Undiyar. Today we're going to talk about the I, the real I, and the false I. The insentient body does not say or feel I. Existence consciousness, sat chit, the real self, does not rise or subside. But in between the body and the real self, a limited I rises as the measure of the body. Consciousness, in the form, I am this body, rises in waking and subsides again in sleep. Know that this I am the body consciousness is called by various names, such as the knot between consciousness and the insentient, Chit Jadagranti or Hridaya Granti, bondage, Bandha, the individual soul, Jiva, the subtle body, Sukshma Sarira, ego, Ahantai, and this mundane state of activity, Sangsara, and mind, Manas. So, you know, I always used to think, it's really amazing, you know, it's, it's really kind of strange that spirit, which is pure consciousness, can be in relation with or be conscious of this material existence, which is basically inert. They are so completely different in character, in their basic nature, and in their activities. So how is it that they can even be related to one another? Well, this is called the granti, the knot. Huh? This uh, very hard to explain, very hard to understand connection that ties these two completely dissimilar things together. So this knot is of the nature of ahankar, false ego. It says, I, I am, huh? but actually it is not. What is that? Well, it's called by many different names, but basically it's a measure of the body. It's like a status indicator. Huh? How am I doing? <laughs> How's the body doing? Is it okay? <laughs> and we measure the body against the body as it was in the past. Or the body how we would like it in the future. Or against other bodies. So in that way we get an indication of how we're doing. Huh? Are we doing okay? Are we in trouble? <laughs> the mind is based on fear. Fear for the body. Is there anything in the present situation that resembles a previous situation in which there was some threat or some suffering in the body, some diminution of the body's uh, condition or status? If so, and we better do something, we better have a plan. <laughs> or we better take action. This is the mind. The mind is always worrying. What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, what are we going to do, you know? The mind is a worry ward. And it gossips, too. <laughs> the mind is full of all kinds of nonsense, uh, verbal expressions, verbal knowledge which it passes off as actual knowledge, but it isn't really knowledge because it's not based on experience. It's only based on words, in most cases heard from others. Uh, Heidegger called this idle talk, and it begins in the mind. The mind wants to pose as I, and it's based on identifying the body as I. But 
the body is basically just a piece of meat. <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful mechanism, and it's amazing in so many ways. But basically, it's just a machine. So there's nothing really too wonderful about the body. <laughs> but what's really wonderful is the real self, the real I am. The, uh, what does he call it here? Sat-chit. The real self. Existence and consciousness. Real existence means eternal and unchanging. And real consciousness means always on. Huh? The self is always awake, always aware. Now, in deep sleep, there isn't anything for it to be aware of. But at all other times, the self is aware of the dreams in sleep, and of the dreams while awaking. And the mind, this is what the mind is, is actually a dream. A dream that I am this body. Huh? Even though actually we have nothing whatsoever to do with the body. The body is just a piece of meat and we are the actual living eternal self. So how is it that these two completely dissimilar things are connected? Well, this is called identification. Identification means that we identify or we take one thing to be something else. For example, taking the body to be the self or taking the mind to be I. This is identification and projection. Projecting our sense of I am on the body and mind when it is obviously neither of them. <laughs> I say obviously because if you actually look at your experience, it's clear that the mind and body are different from the self because they are not aware. The body is a biocomputer and the mind is another kind of computer, the subtle body, Manomaya Kosha. And they are responsible for certain functions, but you can't say that they're alive exactly. Huh? They're not conscious, they're not aware. And without awareness, what's the meaning of I? I is a symbol that means being aware. <laughs> without awareness, there is no I. There is no one to say I am. So, in other words, this idea of being an individual self based on the body is the essence of illusion. So, we call this the fall. Huh? The being falls from being the real I am into a condition of false I am. False identification with the mind and body. And this goes on and on until one takes to the path. Now the path is the exit from this uh, improper, unhealthy, wrong condition and understanding. And it begins with education. It begins with learning. Not necessarily book learning, but learning about the real facts of life and acquiring what is called right view. So all the things that Ramana talks about in these verses are the uh, pieces, the elements of right view. If one views the mind and body rightly, he won't say, I am the body. And he won't consider the mind to be the self. He'll accept only consciousness as the self. Now, does that really change anything? No. To know that will prevent us from making certain mistakes, and that's valuable. But it's only the beginning of self-realization. To actually attain self-realization, one has to meditate. And this is a process that, well, takes a whole lifetime, unless you're really fortunate and have already spent many lifetimes on the path. So what does meditation mean, actually? 
It means neti neti. Looking at the contents of the mind that we normally identify as I, or project as I, and severing our link with them, stopping the identification, stopping the projection, and saying, no, this is not I. This is the mind, or this is the body, or this is some possession that I had identified with myself as part of I-making and mind-making. We went over that earlier, uh, the mula pariyaya, the root sequence. We identify something as mine in order to base the inductive conclusion uh, that I exists. I can say, oh yes, this is my body. <laughs> because this is my body, there must be an I who owns it. Well, there is really an I, but the real I doesn't have anything to do with the body. <laughs> the real I is nothing but the awareness within. So how do we recognize, how do we realize this real I? Well, as I said, meditation is involved and sometimes some, a little austerity is involved. Not too much austerity, huh? don't go out of balance. But simply refrain from some of these identification activities for some time. Uh, so you can more easily realize that they are not the self. Uh, they are not I. The body is not the self. The mind is not the self. These thoughts, these identifications, these aren't the real self. The real self is something else. So what is that? Well, here's the kicker. This is the punchline to this video. <laughs> the real self is not an experience. The real self is the experiencer, the one who is aware, not the things that one is aware of. So what does that mean, actually? <laughs> it means that when people have a so-called enlightenment experience, and then they say, okay, I'm enlightened, I had the experience. No. No, you're not enlightened because you had an experience. Experiences come and go. Even enlightenment experiences come and go. Okay, so you visited the top of the mountain. Huh? <laughs> right now, you go there, you wouldn't see anything. <laughs> it's totally surrounded by fog. But on a clear day, you go up there and you can see very far, yes. But guess what? There's no food or water up there. You have to come down. Huh? So we may have a peak experience. And before in our analysis of yoga, we found that you can reach samadhi based on any of the centers in the body. Uh, the Buddha talked about 84,000 Dharma doors. And what are they? They're the 84,000 nadis, or energy vortexes in the body. So based on those, you can leverage any one of those to reach samadhi. But you have to come out of samadhi. You can't live in samadhi. If you stay in samadhi, the body will die. And there is a class of enlightened people who just go into samadhi and don't come out, and they drop the body. But the original attainment of enlightenment is not based on samadhi. It's not based on any experience. Rather, it's based on recognizing who is actually the experiencer. Is it the body? No, because the body is just a piece of me. Is it the mind? No, because the mind is also just a machine, just a computer. So who is the experiencer, actually? Uh, is it this jiva? Is it this soul? Huh? You know, all that, all these different um, false entities that claim to be I? No, it's not any of those. It is only the real, unconditioned, objectless 
non-dual awareness, I, the self, Brahman, not any individual. The minute you talk about an experience, you're talking about an individual. So that can't be enlightenment. That can't be self-realization. The real self-realization <laughs> is when you realize who you really are. And then there's no more chasing these different experiences or identification <laughs> with these alien things. <laughs> <laughs> the body, the mind, objects, experiences, the senses, huh? memories, desires, all these things go away. Uh, or they may still be there, but you don't think of them as I. Uh, the body is going to exist for a certain time, so okay, let's just ride it out. You know, let it do its thing for a few more years. But one who is self-realized knows well who he really is. Aham Brahmasmi Om Tat Sat Om Harihi Om